Good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Folds from One Accounting, and I'll be the host for your webinar this morning. This is the first of our webinars in a, a series. We're running a number of webinars which are all aimed to help make your life that bit easier. And this morning, we'll be covering basic bookkeeping. First of all, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about us and what we do. So we are a firm of chartered management accountants. We are based in Edinburgh. We work with owner managed businesses. Uh, we like to work with people who have a, a problem with their business not giving them the life they want, whether that means it's not enough return for the effort that's going in, or they want to have a bit more time to do the things that they want to do. What we help them do is help them focus on what's important and to organize their finances. And that gives them that feeling of control within their business. Finally, that means that they have more fun and make more money, or certainly that's what we hope. What we're going to cover today is why this seminar will help you, some of the jargon that accountants, including your accountant, may use, the basics of bookkeeping, common errors that we come across in bookkeeping, and certainly the records that we receive from clients, the importance of bank reconciliations, and what we haven't covered today. So it's a big topic area where we are trying to keep the time to a limited period. So we, unfortunately, we can't cover everything this morning. Why will this help you? Well, it will give you cleaner records, which will give you better information for decisions. So if your records are, are have been booked correctly and the bookkeeping is all done accurately, then you'll have much better information for making decisions on your business. Accurate records will also help you pay the right amount of tax and VAT. Uh, so where possible, we would certainly be helping you to minimize these areas, but just making sure that you have accurate records, then make sure that you're paying the, the right amount or goes a long way towards that. You'll understand what can go wrong and what to watch out for. So we will co cover some of the bookkeeping errors that we come across. And just even being aware of what they are should help you to look out for them and perhaps not make the same mistakes that we see others making. And finally, if you're spending time on actually getting the books up to date, then you know that's not necessarily the best way that your accountant can, can spend his time and your hard-earned money. It's much better if uh, you have a clean set of records that you can give to your accountant, and that way they can give you advice rather than correcting the, the records. So first of all, what we're going to go through is accountant speak, the jargon of accountants. And you'll see on the, the screen, there's a long list of terms, which some of which you may have heard and some of which you may not have. We'll go through these each individually uh, with a brief description, and hopefully that will help improve your understanding. Uh, some of them I'm sure you, you are aware of, but whether you know the, the absolute meaning of them, uh, I'm not sure, so we'll cover that off. So first of all, if we look at debits, credits, and double entry. A, a debit's an asset or expense, so it could be cash in the bank uh, or something where it's expenses like advertising costs, your telephone costs, that type of thing. A credit is a liability or income, so it could be a bank loan, for instance, where you're due money to somebody. It could be trade creditors, VAT, that type of thing, or it could be sales income or other types of income. Double entry is just the, the method of bookkeeping that we use, and it means that every side has two entries. So for every debit, there has to be a credit. That means that each uh, entry into the accounting system has to balance. It's, if you think of it like a set of scales, that's how it works. So next of all, if we go on to ledgers, uh, the picture on the right-hand side would show you what ledgers used to look like. And if you can imagine the, the big old double entry ledger with the old man and his cool pen sitting, and that's certainly how things were done in the, the past a long time ago. These days, your ledger is much more likely to look like uh, something that we've got on the screen there. So uh, a computerized system with a list of the numbers and information that's available. Uh, if we go on to journals now. So journals, sometimes you'll hear people talking about a, a JV, which is just short for journal voucher. And they're how we make entries into the ledgers. 
So depending on your accounting system, it may happen automatically. So for instance, when it, when you post a sales invoice, then that's also going to create a journal voucher for that sales entry. And the same with a, a purchase invoice. You can also enter manual journal vouchers. And I've just given an example at the bottom of what something might look like, a journal voucher might look like. So you would have the account code that is being posted to uh, the account name, debit and credit as to which side of the, the entry it's going to, and then invoice one, two, three to XYZ. So it's just a brief description of what the, the entry is actually for. So if we look at assets, so assets are property which are owned and as regarded as having a value. So if you think of things like cash, then that would be an asset. So cash at bank uh, or things like computers. And obviously there's lots more examples, uh, which I'm sure you can think of for your, your own business. If we go through liabilities, then liabilities are the debts and obligations that the business has. So that could be things, for instance, like a loan from the, the bank, or it could be an HP type agreement, uh, or you could have uh, outstanding amounts to suppliers. So your trade creditors, that would also be a, a debt of the, the business. The balance sheet. So the balance sheet is just a snapshot of the business at a point in time. And it shows your, your assets and liabilities now. Every time that you change one of your assets and liabilities, the value of your balance sheet changes. So it really is just the, the value of the business at any particular point that you choose to run the, the balance sheet. So the part that's quite important that we often look at is the net the asset value, the net asset value. And that's really just the difference between your total assets and your liabilities. What that's made up of then is money that's been put into the business by the, the business owners or the shareholders, uh, or in the, the case of a sole trader, it's the, the capital that's been introduced, and also the, the amount of money that's been generated over the trading period. Uh, so money which hasn't been distributed out, so it's either your, your trading profit or loss, hopefully a profit. I've just got a, a simple example of a balance sheet here. So you'll see that the We've got fixed assets, current assets, which are stock, debtors, bank, and cash. And then we take away from that the current liabilities to the trade debtors, VAT, PYE. So quite common entries in, in most businesses. We've then got long-term liabilities, so an HP agreement. And that gives our net asset value. And that's made up of the capital and reserves, which are the shares, which is the money that's been introduced by the shareholders initially. And then the retained earnings, which is the money that the business has made over its trading period. Next of all, we'll look at the sales ledger and purchase ledger. So the sales and purchase ledger are where sales and purchase invoices are recorded. And again, I just have, uh, have an example at the bottom just to let you see what it might look like. Uh, we've taken the sales ledger there, but generally the purchase ledger will look very similar as well. So if we look at the profit and loss account, the profit and loss shows the difference between the income and expenses of the business, i.e. its profit or loss. The profit and loss we would normally look at over a, a particular period of time. So it might be one month, it could be a quarter, it could be a year. And what we're looking at is the trading performance of the business at that over that time period. Uh, and hopefully we'll see that it's making a, a profit. The, the profit and loss doesn't show the cash position of the business. That's completely different. And there are reasons for that, that we won't go into them in this seminar, uh, but the, you shouldn't equate the, that a business is making profit to the fact that a business is generating cash. Again, I've got an example of a profit and loss account here. So we've got sales, the cost of sales, which are the costs that vary depending on your sales level. That then gives you your gross profit. And then we have a number of different overheads, so things like the accountancy fees, telephone costs, IT stationary, depreciation, and so on. That then gives us our operating profit, and from that we've got some HP interest to come off before seeing the, the net profit before tax at the, the bottom. 
if we now look at overheads, gross profit, and cost of sales. So th these are really just categories of, of costs, certainly in terms of overheads and cost of sales. Uh, your cost of sales varies with the amount that you sell generally. So it could be things like material costs or if you had direct labor where your labor is actually making something that's sold, then uh, that would be a, a cost of sale. Your overheads are fixed costs and they're really going to be there regardless of where the, uh, your level of sales changes in the, the short term or not. So what we're talking about with overheads are things like rent and rates, uh, your advertising costs, that type of thing. And the, the gross profit is important because what we look at when we're uh, doing various break-even analysis, we need to get to a gross profit level that actually covers your overhead base. The gross profit is just the difference between your sales and cost of sales. Uh, so it's your profit before any of your overheads. Again, I've got an example in the, the P&L here which shows you where these actually sit. So in terms of your cost of sales, again, we've got that as a 300,000 and that's costs that vary with sales. Your gross profit is your sales less your cost of sales. And then the total of the overheads will be taken away from your gross profit to give you your operating profit. So now yeah, a couple of really jargony accounting say, terms. We've got depreciation and amortization. So depreciation and amortization are just ways of spreading the cost of assets that last for a longer period. So one of the principles within accountancy is that you try to match costs and income. And what we're looking at is where uh, for depreciation, you have something which may last, say, for instance, for three years, like a computer. So rather than taking the cost of that computer all in one year, we spread the cost over the, the three years that we think the asset is actually going to last for. In terms of the difference between depreciation and amortization, depreciation is for tangible assets, so things that you can touch. And amortization is for intangible assets. So it could be, for instance, where you have a property lease which has been put to the balance sheet because it's going to last for a number of years. If we look at it in real, real terms, then you have the nice shiny new uh, pickup truck which becomes the battered old vehicle on the right-hand side. Well, that's depreciation in real life. We'll now go on to accruals and prepayments. So accruals and prepayments are used to match costs and income to the period in which they occur rather than the period they're invoiced. Now you'll often see where you receive invoices in uh, and it might cover a, something that's for a, a longer period. For instance, you're, if you have a rent invoice, it may well come in quarterly and you pay it quarterly, even although the actual costs are really a monthly cost in terms of the, the actual rent. So when we're preparing a, a profit and loss account, we would look at uh, the period that it covers and then potentially prepay some of the, the costs. So, for instance, if the rent uh, was invoiced quarterly, then if we were looking at a monthly P&L, we would want to split that quarterly payment into three months so that we can see the a, a truer picture of what costs are incurred each month. The accruals are really the, the reversal of that. It's where you receive a service or some goods but haven't been invoiced for them until a later period, in which case we would accrue the cost and you've had the benefit of it, but you also then need to recognize that that's taken place, even though the invoice might not come until later. So just to recap on that, prepayments are where you pay for a cost that covers more than one period. E.g. if you pay rent quarterly, the prepayment would be spread over the individual months of the quarter. And accruals are where you receive goods or a service but haven't yet received the invoice. The accrual books the cost that's been incurred before the invoice is received and this makes sure you have an accurate P&L for the period. So what we don't want is to be having a, a lot of costs that are being incurred but not recorded so our profit or loss looks better than it actually is because the invoice hasn't been received. What we're going to look at just now, very briefly, is just the, the basic uh, books of account that we have in bookkeeping. So in terms of sales, there's a sales day book, and that really just records the individual invoices that are raised each day. 
these days it is very unlikely that you would actually have a, a manual ledger for that. Uh, it's much more likely that it's going to be recorded on a computer system. And then that feeds into your sales ledger, which shows all the outstanding invoices at any point in time. Uh, purchases are very similar, where you would have a purchase day book, which shows everything that's been purchased for that day. And that then feeds into the purchase ledger, which shows everything that's outstanding to your suppliers at any point in time. In terms of the, the general ledger, it really captures uh, three elements. We've got your trial balance, which sums up all the individual accounts. And we should have a, a list of accounts which are in debit or and a, and a list of accounts which are in credit, both of which should match uh, in the totals for the trial balance. The, the trial balance then really forms the basis for preparing your profit and loss and your balance sheet. So now let's have a look at the common errors that are made in accounting or certainly in bookkeeping. So we have control accounts that don't match the, the ledger in terms of debtors and creditors. We have payroll entries which are quite frequently not posted correctly. And in terms of VAT, there's plenty of opportunity for error there. So we have using the wrong VAT code, claiming VAT and expenses where it's not due, the, the reciprocal of that where we don't claim when it is when it is due and dealing with VAT late entries. Uh, we've got bank entries which aren't posted correctly and if you are part of a bigger group of companies then quite often you'll have intercompany loans and again we see a lot of errors in, the, in that area. So what we want to do is give you some decent training here that you can help avoid some of these errors. So first of all, if we look at the debtors and creditors and the control accounts not matching the ledgers, well, what, why would that happen? Uh, there, there's a couple of main reasons that manual journals have been posted to the control accounts, although some of the newer software systems won't let that happen, so you'll be prevented from actually making an entry into the account. Quite often what we see as well is wrong dates being used, so for instance, there's been a, a typo error when a, a sales invoice has been entered and it ends up with a, an invoice dated in the future. We'll just have a, a quick look at an example of this. So on the left hand side, we can see all the entries that have been made in the, the debtors control account. And we have the age debtors report based on the, that information on the right hand side. If you look at how that is then made up, we can see that there's a, a number of items which match off. So for instance, if we look at on the left hand side, XYZ Limited, there's been a sale and there's been a payment, which has then left the remaining balance, which shows on the age debtors report. And similarly for JT training, we have a, an invoice which hasn't been paid, so it's left a balance. And finally, we have the Jolly Roger one, which because the date has actually been entered as 2014 rather than 2013, it doesn't appear on our age debtors report dated the 28th of February 2013. So it is in the ledger and we would see the transaction there, but we don't see it on the, the sales le the age debtors report. And it's similar for that for the, the manual entry, the JV payment for the rent prepayment, which has been booked to the wrong account. So if we look down at the bottom, we'll see why the age debtors report doesn't match the entries that are going through the, the actual debtors control account and why they would be out at that particular point in time. So we've got the manual journal which has been posted to the wrong account which would need to be corrected and we've got the invoice with, with the wrong date. So it would appear on the age debtors report if you ran it, the age debtors report at 2014, which obviously don't want to do. We want to see the current one. Uh, and these differences would need to be corrected so that the, the actual control account and the report were both in line with each other. So let's have a look at payroll entries and where they go wrong. So quite often what we see is that the actual net payment that's made from the bank, so the physical amount that's been paid to paid to the employees 
it's posted straight to the, the profit and loss account, whereas really it should go to a control account. And what we also find is that the PYE and NI, which some of that is employer's national insurance, is actually a, a cost, but the rest of it is really just being collected on behalf of HMRC and should be included in the, the overall wage cost that that's all posted to the P&L. Again, it should really go to a control account. So in terms of getting the, the payroll journal right, there's three main elements uh, for posting it correctly. There's the gross pay, so that's the top line that your employee's paid. The net pay, which is what the employee gets after tax and deductions. And of course, making sure that the tax and NI is posted correctly as well. So let's have a, a quick look at a payroll journal and how that would look in practice. So if you look at the top part, then we have wages of £500, tax of £50, national insurance of £10, and a net pay of 440 In addition to that, there would also be employer's national insurance, which would be an additional £50. So how that translates to the a payroll journal would be that we post the, to the wages in the P&L the, the gross amount of the, the payment, which is 500 We have the employer's NI, which is also a cost, so that's posted to the P&L 2, and that's £50. If we add up all the tax and NI, so that's the, the employee's tax and the employee's and employer's NI, then we have £110, which is posted to the control account on the balance sheet. And finally, the net pay, which again is posted to the balance sheet, to the wages control account. If we look at the bank entry that would be made, then Basically, we're taking money out of the bank, so there's a credit to the bank, and we post it to the wages control account when the payment's actually been made. Now, what you'll see there, the two items that are highlighted, is that they will net off to zero once all the entries have been made. And you would have a similar position with the tax and NI control, that once the final payment has been made to HMRC, then that should come down to zero as well in that particular account. So let's have a look at some of the VAT errors that, that are common. Uh, we can't cover everything. We, we've got a limited amount of time. And in terms of this one, it's quite a big area, so we're only really going to give you a tester of some of the, the things that we come across. So in terms of business entertaining, we can't claim any VAT on that. So that could be meals, it could be drinks, it could be events uh, like sports matches, and somebody getting taken to the football or the rugby. So no that on any of these. And in terms of gifts, any alcohol and food, again, we can't claim any VAT back on them if we've bought them to give to, to clients. If it's gifts that are costing more than £50, then we need to account for output VAT if the input VAT was reclaimed. So what that means is that if there's relatively low value gifts, so less than £50, then that's allowed. You can claim the VAT back on that unless it's for alcohol and food. If you give gifts of more than £50, so a number of gifts that are all individually less than £50, but they all go to the one person and they total up more than £50, then again, VAT can't be claimed on them. And again, for travel, there's no VAT on flights or train fares. Uh, technically, the it's not strictly no VAT, but for the purposes of this, we're not going to go into what's an exempt supply or what's a zero rated supply. Uh, just assume that there is no VAT that is reclaimable. So we'll now have a look at where VAT sometimes missed. Uh, there's very s specific rules in relation to a lot of these. So if you're ever not sure, then please just give us a call and we can clarify any points that you have. So although we said that entertaining can uh, be reclaimed for VAT purposes, then staff entertaining can, and it's really to cover effectively the, the Christmas party, although it doesn't have to be taken in one go. So you can claim VAT back on entertaining of staff up to £150 per head. Now the way that that works is that the event that takes you over the £150 per head cannot be claimed. So it's not a case of you've got £150 limit. If you spent £90 and then spent a sub, uh, another £80, then unfortunately the £80 couldn't be claimed. However, if you spent £90 
and that a subsequent event spent another 40, and then they can both be claimed. Uh, on HP contracts, then, sometimes the, the VATs usually pay them one lump sum, and normally that can be claimed back in, in your next VAT return based on the HP contract. It's quite a tricky area, just making sure that it's the, the right type of contract that you have. So between on leasing contracts, we've really got three types. We've got HP, finance, and operating leases. Typically, for finance leases and operating leases, you should receive a VAT schedule from the, the actual lease company, and it will have a monthly or a quarterly uh, payment along with the, the VAT that can re be reclaimed back on that. Uh, for mileage claims, VAT can be claimed on them, uh, but you do need to keep the fuel receipts. Uh, so there's a, a formula for actually working out how much VAT you can reclaim back for mileage claims. So that's on your, your 45 pence a mile. Uh, but again, you know, please contact us if you're not very sure about that. Um, postage and carriage. Well, normal postage is exempt, so there's no VAT on it. Uh, so no VAT that can be reclaimed. But you will find that courier costs, for instance, or parcel posts will frequently have VAT on them. So it's something to watch out for that if you do a lot of uh, carriage or have a lot of postage that's not just your standard buying of stamps, then please check that you're actually claiming VAT back that you're allowed. And again, using the wrong VAT code in your system, quite often what will happen is that a software system will have a VAT code tied up to each of the expense accounts. Now, if you have a particular account where there's vatable and non-vatable expenses going through that account, so postage or carriage might be an example of that, then if the system is defaulting to a particular VAT code, you may well find that it's not the correct one in all instances. So just be aware of that, uh, something to check. We also see frequent problems with the VAT errors on late entries. So again, what happens here is where a VAT return has been run, the period's been closed off, and then subsequently maybe an invoice comes in late, and that's booked to an earlier VAT period. Now, depending on the system that you have, uh, that may or may not be picked up automatically by the system. Uh, so it's something to be aware of. It should be picked up if you're reconciling your VAT to the nominal ledger, uh, but you won't necessarily pick it up just by running a VAT return unless you're aware of the, the settings that you need to use for your particular type of software. And we've got an example here. We're big fans of Xero, uh, which is a, an online cloud accounting system, but you'll see within Xero that you need to tick a box that says include VAT late claims, and that basically means that any invoices which haven't been included in previous VAT returns will get picked up. So it makes it nice and easy, but you do need to be aware that uh, that's something that you need to, to tick. So let's now look at bank entries that haven't been posted correctly. So the types of things that we've often come across are purchase payments going to the P&L rather than against the purchase invoice. And the issue here is that it can double up on your expenses. So if you've taken the, the purchase invoice and you've posted it, your entries will have gone to the P&L as the expense, and you'll have an outstanding invoice sitting in trade creditors. What we see happening is then that the bank payment is made to the supplier, but instead of being offset against the supplier's invoice, it's actually posted to the P&L as an expense. So you end up with two expenses in there and an outstanding supplier's invoice. And there's sometimes bank entries that are missed, like bank charges are a common one. And loan repayments where it's a capital and interest payment, but it's not split between the interest and capital. It's just all posted to uh, the interest account, for instance. Uh, we see wages payments being posted to the P&L rather than the wages control account. So we went through them in earlier, and hopefully that gives you a better understanding of how to post the, the wages journal. And we might see partial invoice payments not being dealt with appropriately. So again, it's similar to point one where you know, if, the, if there's a payment that's been made to a supplier but doesn't cover a full invoice, it's posted to the P&L rather than being posted as a partial payment to the supplier's invoice. 
And finally, if you've got multiple bank accounts, you may have a savings account uh, as well as your ordinary current account, then quite often the transfers between these accounts aren't posted. So the last one we're going to look at is intercompany loans. This won't apply to everybody because it really means that you need to have a, a group of companies or a, at least two companies which are operating together. And what we're looking at here is where money is being transferred or being paid between the two companies. So we've said that five doesn't equal four. And really all that's the key point here is that you need to make sure that the corresponding entry in one company is made to the corresponding entry in the other company. Uh, quite often we'll see uh, entries being posted in one company and posted to the loan account. So it looks like the, the that company one is either due money or due to receive money from the second company. But if the entry isn't made in the second company's accounts or made to a different place, then the two intercompany loan accounts don't correspond to each other. So it's very important to make sure that they're kept correct. Okay, in terms of uh, the bank reconciliation, we're going to go through what is it and why is it so important. So the bank reconciliation checks that all the transactions through your bank account have been recorded in your account system. And you need to do that for all bank accounts and credit cards. And where possible, although your cash might be a smaller amount, you should also do it for cash accounts. It's really key uh, that this is done. It's this sort of fundamental area for making sure that your books and records are, are more accurate. So what, why is it so important? If you don't do a bank reconciliation, then you can't be sure that you've recorded all the transactions through your bank. And right, again, we've gone through some of the common items that are missed. So bank charges, bank interest, irregular payments, for instance. You might be picking up your monthly direct debit payments, but say, for instance, you have a, an annual direct debit payment for a, a subscription then it's quite often that that gets missed. Uh, so it is important that your bank reconciliation is done on a regular basis. We're just going to have a look at what the bank reconciliation actually means. So if we look at the top, that's given the, the transactions that are through our accounting system for the bank. And then down at the bottom, we have a list of the transactions that we've downloaded from our internet banking system. And what we would do to reconcile the bank is we just match off each of the transactions. So we're looking at the ones that are in our accounting system. Now, if you have a manual system, it may well be that you're just recording these on a, a spreadsheet, so that's fine. All we need to do is make sure that you've matched them off against the bank account just in the, the same way. Uh, if you have an accounting system, then usually it's some form of uh, ticking uh, system to make sure that it's shown as being reconciled within the actual account system. But it's a case of going through each of the transactions on your bank statement and making sure that they have been recorded. At the end of it, if we were doing a, a manual bank reconciliation, this is how it would look. So we would have the last reconciled balance. We'd have the movement for the, that particular period. So we could say that that's a month. And we would have the new cash book balance. So that's really the balance that we'd expect and per our accounting system. What we then need to do is we would add any items that have been paid but not through the bank. We would take away any items received but which haven't cleared the bank. And then we would add any items that were in the physical bank account but that we hadn't recorded in the cash book and take away any items that had been paid in the physical bank but weren't in our cash book. And that would then bring us back to our bank balance, hopefully. So again, you can see on here, I've just highlighted the end and bank balance. And from the previous screen, that was our, our closing bank number. So it reconciled at that point. So if we look at this, the actual format of the, the bank reconciliation, where the, the top two lines where we're looking at add items paid but not through the bank, and less items received but not through the bank, uh, they're really timing differences. So it's things like checks that have been written but not cashed or checks that have been received but not cleared through the, the bank. And the bottom two, that tends to be things that haven't been written up in the bank in, in our actual account system. So they've 
entered your physical bank or come out of the physical bank, but they don't appear. So it could be things that haven't been written up, for example, annual direct debits that we were talking about earlier on. So what we're going to do now is we're introducing another item and so we've reconciled our bank, which are all the, the highlighted items, and we now have another check, 139, for a thousand pounds, which has uh, been written in our accounting system, but which hasn't cleared the bank. So again, if we look at how that would be reflected in the closing bank reconciliation, then our new cash book balance has changed because we've now got a thousand pounds less in our in our own accounting system, uh, but that's now added back so that when we come back to the bank statement, there isn't any change from the earlier example, and we still have the, the same number for the bank statement. And what we're going to do now is we're adding in a, a bank transfer. Uh, so we have a an amount that's been received into the, the bank, uh, but which we haven't recorded in our account system. So again, if we look at what happens now, then we are still have our, our check, which has been written but not cleared through the bank from earlier on, check 139. And we now have a transfer, which has been paid into the bank, but it's not in our cash book. And again, now the, the bank balance has changed since we have more in the bank than we, we did have earlier on. So if we look at these items then, Really, the, the ones that are in yellow, they're timing differences, and they shouldn't really be part of the reconciliation for a long time. So really what we're looking at here is things where, for instance, we've written a check that's been sent to a supplier. The supplier hasn't uh, put, paid, their, paid that check into their own bank account immediately, and there might be a bit of a, a timing difference. On the, the bottom half, then these are entries that are missing from the accounting system, so we need to fix them as soon as possible. Uh, they they have appeared in your physical bank account, so they do need to be reflected. So what is good practice? Well, reconcile your bank accounts on a regular basis, and again, that means all the bank accounts and credit cards. Now, regular basis would depend on the number of transactions that you have, but it could be weekly, it could be monthly. Show the dates of the unreconciled items, so we want to make sure that we don't have anything sitting on the, the bank reconciliation for an extended period of time where we don't do anything with it. Uh, if items are in the bank but not in your system, then we need to fix them as soon as possible. And we should write off any old checks which you've written but have not cleared the bank. So uh, Legally, a check can stay in existence for up to six years. But in practice, most people tend to write them off after six months. Generally, what will happen is if the check hasn't been cashed by that point, then it's probably been replaced by a subsequent payment or the supplier has lost it. Now, we also want to investigate payments received which have not cleared the bank, so you haven't really been paid. What you want to check there is, is it an error? So is it a duplicate in your, your own system? What we'll do now, we've been through the bank reconciliation, we'll take you through what we haven't covered in our, our webinar so far, uh, and that just gives you an idea of things that you know, are still important, but we just don't have time to cover them today. So there's different types of VAT schemes, we've got accrual schemes, cash accounting, flat rate VAT, again lots more jargon from the accountants. Uh, some schemes will be appropriate for you and some won't be, and we can provide advice on that should you require that. Uh, although we've gone through depreciation and what that actually means, we haven't shown you how to calculate it, so there's various different options. Uh, we've got straight line, we've got reducing balance. We have different periods, so again, uh, lots of different terms to, to get to grips with there. Uh, for loans and HP, again, the, the main thing is making sure that the interest payment is split out correctly from the the capital, re the capital payment. Sometimes that can be more difficult than the uh, potentially a seem just because of the way that the loan payments are made. So quite often you'll have a flat payment each month, but that could be a higher amount of interest in the earlier periods of the loan and then a lower amount later on. And it's just how we calculate that that differential. Uh, 
we would normally supply you with your year-end corrections. So once we've done your final accounts, which we've prepared from your, your bookkeeping that you've given to us, then if there was any changes that we've made, which usually there is, then we would supply you with year-end corrections to put into your own system. Again, uh, it's just really being aware of the types of things that, that you need to do and how that's done. So please give us a call if you've got any questions on that. Uh, although we've sort of talked about the financial statements, so profit and loss account and balance sheet, trial balance, we haven't really gone into them in any, any detail as to how to interpret them. Uh, we do have a separate webinar on that, which we're going to be running. Uh, so please feel free to join us on that one if you're interested in finding out more about that topic. And also making the best of your software. So uh, in terms of the, the software that we particularly recommend, we have Zero and Free Agent. If you're already using them, then we'd be happy to spend some time just showing you uh, tips and tricks and helping to make sure that you're getting the best out of it. If you're not using them and you're using one of the other more traditional softwares, then please give us a call and we can uh, give you some of the benefits that you would get from moving from traditional desktop software to a cloud-based system. So what we have covered today, well, we've covered the accountant speak. Hopefully we've uh, taken away a bit of the, the mysteriousness of the, the jargon that accountants use. We've gone through the basics of bookkeeping, so we've shown you uh, bank reconciliations, we've shown you how the ledgers work together, and we've also shown you the common errors that can occur. So hopefully with that knowledge in mind, then you'll be able to avoid making some of the mistakes that other people do. And finally, we've gone through the importance of bank reconciliation, why that's a sort of fundamental core piece of the bookkeeping puzzle. So what to do next? Well, if you've been through this and you think, oh my God, this seems really tough, it's much more complicated than I thought, then please give us a call. We'd be delighted to speak to you and I'm sure we can help sort you out. If, on the other hand, you really like what you've seen, then still please give us a call. We'd be delighted to speak to you about what else we can help, help you with. Uh, there's lots of other areas and I'm sure if your bookkeeping's in good order, then we can certainly help provide you with. Uh, other good advice. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you 